Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. Happy July, everyone. You made it, sort of. First half of the year, done. But with a lot of carnage in tech and bonds and crypto, heck, even cotton was down 30% this week, which is interesting enough to get a cotton specialist I know on the pod. Stay tuned for that next week. Plus, we're going to get an institutional vol seller on soon. See how the longer term big money thinks about all this volatility. On to this episode, I mentioned the crypto sell-off and our guest Lee Drogan of Starkiller Capital has some thoughts. What a great firm name, Starkiller. We talk about how he came up with that, how he's doing trend following on a portfolio of coins and yield farming and living his best life surfing and skiing, which I may have spent too much time talking about. Sorry, that's what I'm into. Uh, This was a fun one where we see who can hold two separate thoughts in their head at the same time. Send it. This episode brought to you by RCM's Managed Features Group and their newest white paper titled Your Guide to Trend Following. Our guest here today is Trend Following Crypto. How do they do it? Why do they do it? When does it work? When doesn't it? Ping the team at RCM to dig in. Check out everything RCM does plus that white paper at rcmalts.com. Now back to the show. Okay, I'm pumped to start talking surfing and skiing with Lee Drogan. Did I get the last name right? Drogan? Yep. yep. Lee Drogan of Star Killer. We got to get into that name too. So welcome, Lee. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I get flack in the comments a lot when I spend too much talk, time talking skiing and such. Um, <laughs> so if that's you right now, listener, fast forward 20 minutes or so, because this is too good to pass up. Because I see your picture there and you actually told me that you train for big wave surfing what what exactly does that mean yeah so i i grew up uh on fire island uh which is a barrier island kind of uh, about an hour and a half from new york city on long island surfing and uh traveled around the world to surf as a kid a bit and then went out to university of san diego uh where during the winter we get you know pretty big swell there and just uh, a little south in mexico and uh there was actually a, an elective course at uh, University of San Diego called uh, Big Wave Surf Survival. Wow. And uh, it was a lot of fun that, yeah, basically taught us to survive in kind of the biggest waves possible. And since then, I've, you know, at the age of 19, kind of went on to surf, you know, bigger and bigger waves all around the world. And uh, uh, yeah, a lot of fun. So tons of questions. There one university of san diego this isn't a question the toreros i think right the toreros yeah all right i used, I used to know all the d1 basketball school mascots it was a little party trick so toreros was a good one the uh but fire island how many people surf there it's cold as heck right well so I, i'll admit that i'm not much of a cold wave surfer um i'll put on a three two suit but once we get to like you know gloves and booties i'm you know i'm i'm tapping out yeah. Uh, so I don't really surf on the East Coast during the winter, but you know, once it hits uh, late May, June, I'll, I'll get in the water. Yeah. And there's like actual r- legit waves there. Yeah, the, there's. I'd say you know from from that period until late October when the water's still real warm on the East Coast, there's probably a good you know two dozen surf days and probably a dozen really good surf days out there, um, depending on how the sand is kind of structured and, uh, you know, wind and and swell, but yeah, it gets it. And is this you on the picture over your shoulder? That's, that's not me. That's actually a famous uh, surf uh, photographer, Aaron Chang, I believe. And that's Jaws. That's, uh, that's Piahi out in, but I love, I love the photo and I have it in my office because it's, it's basically representative of, the scramble when things go wrong out there. It's, it's basically just chaos and everybody's just scratching to get over the set and not get cleaned up. And is that jaws pre toe in surfing? Like they're Uh, all, they're all paddling. I didn't think. No, no, that's, that's post that's post toe in. So now you're actually kind of considered to be a bit of a wuss. If you're (laughs) towing into jaws on a day when it's not wind, like super windy, because they can basically paddle in at any size now. Mm. That's awesome. Uh, so quick aside on my honeymoon, we were in Maui 
and I'm, I grew up on East coast of Florida, Vero beach. So we would surf what we thought were waves, but they were like a foot to two feet high. Maybe, um, Kelly Slater grew up just up the coast there in Indian Atlantic about my age. But, um, so I fashioned myself as somewhat of a surfer. So we're on our honeymoon and I'm like, we got to go see Jaws. <laughs> so we're literally like driving through this pineapple field. And she's like, what are we doing? There's some burnt out cars on the side. And I never found it. Like I couldn't see it from the shore. <laughs> It was getting dark. We abandoned, but uh, I wanted to see it. Um, and I'll, my last bit there, did you watch the HBO series? I'm sure 100 Foot Wave. I did. Yeah, it was pretty good. It was, uh, it was entertaining. Although I'll have to say that one of my like, or my only kind of, you know, hot take on on surfing is that uh, Nazare is not a wave. It's a, it's a swell. So it shouldn't be counted as uh you know, that, uh, that record, it doesn't really break top to bottom. Like jaws does. It's kind of more mm. like a rolling swell. Yeah. That's an, and that whole measurement thing is a little weird. Do, do you feel like those are accurate just from the photos? I mean, I'm sure they could figure it out from the photos, but it's, for me, it's still at the maximum height of the wave. The surfer is not in the dangerous part of the wave. They're not kind of True. under the lip. Like you are at jaws where, you may be riding a 50 foot wave at jaws and you're literally in the tube like Kai Lenny. And, and that's, that's just, Next yeah, it's level, a totally right. different thing. Yeah. Um, so what's the biggest one you've ridden? Oh, uh, I was at Hanalei Bay in Hawaii probably five or six years ago. And, uh, it was, it was a good, you know, well, for Hawaii, they would probably say it was like a 12 foot day. But for me, you know, it was more like a 20 foot day on the face. And, that, and that's yeah. kind of where I tap out. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty big for a guy in Montana. Um, so moving on, you moved to Montana and whitefish. So I've never skied whitefish, skied Bridger Bowl first time this year. Mm -hmm. um, what's it like up there? You just oh, you man. before we came on, it just started to be summer. Yeah, Whitefish is amazing. Uh, you know, relatively small town, but we got the airport here just 15 minutes away, flies direct back to New York, LA, San Diego, wherever. Um, great, great hockey town. I play a lot of hockey here. There's a rink right in town. And then the mountain, the powder is incredible. Um, and I'll admit, I, I don't take as much advantage of it as I should just because I'm a more warm water sports guy. But, you know, I'll get up there a dozen times uh, a winter. And, uh, yeah, great community. Um, just a, just a really, really fun place out, out West. Um, and right next to Glacier, right? We are. Yeah. We're like 25 minutes from Glacier. So we go hiking there all summer and, uh, uh, we were up there just riding bikes on going to the sun road before it opens to the cars. Cause it's not even plowed all the way up to the pass and, uh, just, yeah, some amazing views. Uh, it's like Switzerland in America. Yeah, my it's right up there with me. Got to be a top three national park for sure. Yeah. Um, and you see a lot of grizzlies. We saw like six when we were there. Yeah, we saw some bears the other day when we were up there. Yeah. Which is hard for those guys in Glacier just eat berries and stuff, right? Uh, yeah, I don't think they're uh, fishing in the streams uh, yeah. or the rivers. Yeah. So that's a hell of a lot of berries. I'm like, how do you get? How do they get that big? Yeah. Um, so, and your name, I mentioned real quick, my, we named my daughter Layton. So we got a L E I G H similar name construction there. Where, where'd that one come from? Yeah. You know what? I don't know what my parents were thinking exactly, but I guess they didn't want to know. And they thought I was going to be a girl. So I was supposed to be a, a, a Leia and they just shortened it to, to Lee. Uh, I was actually playing around with that, that like kind of, um, uh, that site that shows how many people have your name by year, you know, thing was going around a couple yeah, weeks yeah. ago. And I think I'm, I'm one of five Lees with this spelling over a decade. So, wow. you know, I don't know if my parents were trying to be kind of like counter trend, whatever, but, uh, it didn't catch on. <laughs> didn't catch on. I was joke of like kids names these days. Our friends are screwed, right? If I remember back to high school or college, it's like, John, Dave, Brian, right? All these normal names. Now the kids have to think of like Hunter and all these other names. Um, so, all right. If someone's tuning back in from the, we're done with our surf and ski convo. I'll ask you one more surf move. Best favorite surf movie. 
Oh, uh, got to be September sessions. Um, September sessions. Yeah, which is a, it's basically a trip that Kelly Slater and friends take to Indo on a boat. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and Jack Johnson is on the trip yeah, as well. Yeah, I it's, think I've seen that. Yeah. It's actually funny. So Jack Johnson, the music that he put into that surf film ended up being half of the songs from his first album. And uh, that kind of launched his career. So great movie, great music, great surfing. Yeah. Yeah. He seems like he's got quite the life, right? Surfer, oh, yeah. songwriter gets out there. He's got it dialed in. Yeah. Let's talk crypto a little bit. Uh, and I'll preface by admitting I'm a bit of a skeptic, uh, sometimes professionally, uh, on purpose, just to make sure we're not missing anything. But uh, I invested for some education and fun back in 16, um, but like less than less than 10,000-ish. Uh, but recently made a bet that we'll never get a back above 50,000 in Bitcoin. Uh, so I'm not sure where to start. So let's start with what worries you most about everything that's gone down these past few months. Uh, we'll circle back to what gets you most excited, but let's start with the, in the wart department, what's, uh, what's most troubling from a investor standpoint. Oh, <laughs> so many things. <laughs> really? Yeah. I guess I'll, I'll yeah, say or just mo not most, but let's just go down the list. Yeah. You know, I mean, know. so all of these things I put in the category of was very likely going to happen anyway, still troubling, still awful. Um, and also you need to hold these two concepts that are kind of opposing in your mind at the same time that all of these awful things are happening and were likely to happen. And yet it likely won't matter anyway to the long-term growth of the asset class. So kind of try and, try and hold those two things uh, at the same time. Um, so the awful things, let's see, we, we are literally going through the same shadow banking collapse as 1929 that all of our securities laws were written to avoid. <laughs> and it's most kind of annoying to me because I've been screaming about the fact that this was going to happen for several years now and that we have this whole thing called decentralized finance, which is great, and that relies on over collateralized loans that automatically liquidate when they become not over collateralized anymore. And that works out really well. Nothing there has really broken yet. But over the last couple of years, these kind of centralized pools of risk and lending have popped up like Celsius and Voyager. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of them now. And they made under collateralized or sometimes non collateralized loans to funds and, and individuals and of course, in a big you know, price meltdown, all of these firms are now insolvent. And guess who you know, really takes the brunt of it is the retail investors who basically gave them money as a, a yield swap trade, right? I give you my coins or my USDC, you give me back 8% yield. And then of course they went and gambled with the money, right? Making bad yeah. loans and whatever. Well, of course this was gonna happen eventually. And I it just, all the laws are written to avoid shadow banking, and yet we did it again. So, it, so important fact there, it's not necessarily the fact that they're offering a yield. It's what they're doing with the money once they get it. It's like a... No, no look, I, I think the, the concept of selling a yield swap to a retail consumer is already illegal, right? You can't do that. So the SEC should have shut all of these things down from day one, my inclination is to believe that they didn't because they kind of wanted this to blow up to say, hey, I told you so. Yeah. But the thing is, like, they're going to use that to then go say all of crypto is whatever and we need to regulate it, whatever. But the thing is, all the DeFi stuff, which is not this, is all working perfectly fine. So we could have just stuck with DeFi, but instead these tech bros came in and said, hey, give me your coins, I'll give you 8%. And, uh, you know, but... You have no recourse to it. There's no FDIC insurance. There's there's nothing. Do um, you think it was the tech bros came in or the finance bros? Right? No, was these, it like are, these are tech Street bros. Guys? No, these are tech bros. The Wall Street guys, the guys who were engineers at Two Sigma and Citadel and, and those places, they all built DeFi things. The tech bros built centralized CFI things and blew it up. And they thought, hey, I've just created perpetual motion or something, right? Like I've... 
So would you would you go so far as called a Ponzi in some of those? Right. Because they needed to pay the yield to get more investors in. Well, okay, so there's two different things going on here. There are Ponzi ish schemes. Right. And those were destined to fail. And there are some in DeFi too, like that, like Terra. Terra was basically a Ponzi-ish scheme where they were subsidizing the yield that you were getting with investor money, basically. Yeah. And what happens is when the desire for leverage decreases and there's nobody that's borrowing from the system, well, then there's no more money to pay the people who have deposits, right? And then the thing collapses, which is what happened. What's happening in these CFI shadow banks is a little bit different. What they did was they said, okay, we're going to give you seven or 8%. And then they went out and made risky loans, whether it was in DeFi or whether it was direct lending. But the thing was, they weren't really good at making the loans. (laughs) And then they blew themselves up. So that wasn't necessarily a Ponzi scheme. It was just like, they were bound to do it poorly eventually. And they eventually did. And what? Do you have insight into what some of those loans were? Like their loan? Oh, yeah. Like what what are some of the egregious examples? Then? I mean, one of them was Terra. Like a lot of yeah. the Celsius stuff comes out of, you know, Terra blowing up. But there are other things like Terra that they've been blown up in as well. There are other lending protocols um, <clears throat> on chain uh, that uh, that haven't gone well for them. And then in some cases, the yield on, you know, stable coins has just dropped to kind of two or 3%. And so now you've got a mismatch between what they're paying out and, you know, Mm. what they're getting. And they try to lever it up. And, you know, what happens when you use leverage in a bear market doesn't doesn't go so well. So when you're saying they were making bad loans, it was all still in the crypto arena, right? They were just saying, all right, we're going to pay out four and we're going to go do it over here ourselves and get eight and keep yeah because they there. knew that just like terra if they dropped the yield that you were getting there would be a run on their bank just like yeah. there was with terra and they didn't want to do that so they tried to yolo the trade and it didn't work out very well didn't work. the uh traders here in chicago back in the day called it the o'hare spread oh yeah, yeah. So you'd put in the pits here you'd put yeah. on a big trade you'd take the cab to o'hare you'd call the clearing firm right before your plane boarded did i make money Nope, you get on the I'm plane. Done. Did I did I make money? Yes. Okay, I'm coming back. Yep. Um, all right, that's one. So it's 1929 style uh shadow banking. Yep. What's what's the next wart? Um, yeah, I, I'd say number two was uh this conversation around does web three really have any real world use cases to it? Um And, you know, I I think there's a lot of ways to have that discussion, but the way that I prefer to approach it is uh, no, there really are no real world (laughs) Web3 use cases today, right? But at the same time, we're still really, really early in the development of this technology. None of these things scale technically, right? They break all the time. Um, There's you know, a limited number of people that are really attempting to use it for the actual utility of it versus the casino of it, right? Mm. Um, So you have to look at it as a progression of utility, not, oh, there's nothing here today, there will never be anything here tomorrow. What we're basically seeing is the same progression that you saw in the internet from the late 80s through the mid aughts, right? where you go from dial up where you really can't do much of anything to DSL where you can kind of do a little bit more stuff to you know broadband and you know really good graphics cards uh, and memory where like you, you can do all the things that you can do today. You can't expect this stuff to do all of it from day one, but I think the difference between this and let's say the late 80s, very early 90s in the internet is that wasn't financialized at the time. You couldn't own TCP IP, right? And so in this world, we go through these big bubble and bust cycles that are basically hype cycles and everybody screams, oh, well, it doesn't do anything. Well, it's because it's still really early, but yet, yeah, you can bet on it on like, you know, the early internet. So it's, um, uh, it's, it's disappointing that we're gonna have to go through another one of these troughs, but it was, it was inevitable. But it, it almost speaks to the, like, if it's going to be the next TCP IP or whatever, a protocol, and you're investing in that protocol, is that 
if that's a single token or a single, is that a, is that scalable enough? Is that legit enough to be able to be that for the whole Web 3.0, right? That's, that's why I always got a little hung up of like, almost seems like it needs to not be a singly, a single, I'm going to reuse the word protocol again, but a single, what do we call that? A single uh, coin protocol, whatever. Yeah, level one chain. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, I think we're still... I think we're still before the um, consolidation of users onto one kind of platform or chain or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they're still hashing this out. And the reason is because none of these things are yet scalable, but the conceptual frameworks that they've built are very obviously the future of the entire financial and technology, you know, ecosystem. Um, that, that much I'm, I'm a hundred percent sure of. I'm also pretty certain that it's likely that none of the things currently existing will win. It's Mm -hmm. likely that there will be something else that, you know, comes along as we continue to develop that is the eventual big winner that consolidates everything. And how do, how do you think about why not just be a VC and own some of the companies, not the coins, right? Like, so is the winner going to be a, the next microsoft or google of this space like a company that yeah. does this or is it going to be a a level one what you call it? level one level one chain or yeah chain, so chain. There, yeah there are two reasons um one has to do with the investable aspects of a strategy and the other one has to do with the scalability of and size of whatever is going to win the thing that's going to win here is going to be a decentralized um, chain or, or protocol. Uh, that much is sure. Um, it will be originally backed by a company, but then it will become something that looks more like Ethereum. Um, it will become a protocol uh, that is you know, decentrally owned. The more important piece of, and I think VCs will do really well investing in picks and shovels uh, around the ecosystem. Uh, But you're seeing one of the big problems with that strategy right now, which is because this whole asset class is so bubble and bust driven, and we can get into the thesis of why that's the case, but because it's so bubble and bust driven, the VCs end up having to take a tremendous amount of vol inside of their portfolios by not being able to manage risk in those illiquid investments. And, you know, Cliff Asnes would say, in a sense, they are volatility laundering because they tell their pension fund um, LPs, well, you know, give us money for 10 years and, you know, we'll come yeah. back in 10 years, right? Don't, don't look at the vol during these 90% drawdowns, uh, hence the volatility laundering, you know, yeah. name for Cliff. I think he used it with private equity, but yeah, applies yes. there too, even more it, so, it, it's, it's higher vol. Yeah. Exactly. It, it, in fact, they're laundering even more volatility <laughs> yeah, here exactly. than they are in, in PE, in a sense. So my view is that if you believe in the beta of the assets and the asset class over a long horizon, as these VCs do, um, that the liquid tokens are liquid enough that you can run trend following and momentum models to manage risk get very similar beta characteristics on the way up and then be able to extricate yourself from that beta, you know, when these bus cycles happen. And, um, you know, to me that just, I think both strategies work in in the long run, but for me, I I would much rather be able to manage risk than have to hold through a 90 or 95% drawdown. (laughs) Or they're, they're saying, Hey, I'm going to have 20 of these. 19 of them are going to lose 95% or 99%. And the one makes whatever, 19 million percent. We're all good. Uh, Well, there's, well, there's that there's the portfolio theory of it, right. Which also is difficult to swallow if you're somebody who comes from my background, but the other part of it is even your big winners. Like if you consider something like the VCs who invested in Solana very early on, right they've, and their coins are locked up. They've had a massive win, but if their coins are still locked up, they've just gone through a 90% drawdown in their Mm. most massive win, right? So like how many people can stomach the biggest win that they've ever had drawing down 90% and still saying, I believe in it. Yeah, it's hard. 
Well, but that's what a lot of the believers right now, right? If they bought back in pre-2016, they're like, hey, I'm still massively up, even though I'm also massively down. I can be both at the same time. Yep. You want to go into what exactly Starkiller does here or cover some more warts? We can come back to the warts. Um, yeah, we can we can get into well, okay, so here's here's the other wart, and it kind of leads in yeah, to um, it, it leads into the the core thesis that we've got, which is uh, you know, when we look at firms like Three Arrows Capital, you know, which is one of, if not the biggest, you know, liquid crypto hedge fund that, that just blew up 19 billion under management. Did uh, they find those guys yet? No, I don't think so. No, <laughs> I think they're still MIA. Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, and I don't mean to pile on here, uh, but, it, and I think, again, you have to hold these two things in your mind at the same time. It's very obvious that Three Arrows levered up in a lot of different ways, some of which were stupid, um, others which were relatively intelligent, but they were using a lot of leverage. Whether it was simply a YOLO trade for them or they didn't believe what I'm about to say, I'm not, I'm not sure it matters because they were wrong no. anyway. I'm going to choose B, even though I don't know what you're going to say. Yet. Likely it's B, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of people out there that didn't believe that this asset class would ever draw down 80 or 90% again, right? And, and I, I've had a lot of conversations with very smart people who were not true crypto believers who still thought because of the institutionalization of the asset class that it wouldn't do that again, right? That maybe that drawdown would be 60% or 50% or something like that, right? Yeah. Our core assumption from the very beginning was that you cannot have the type of growth in the asset class that crypto exhibits without the associated vol, right? And because this market is incredibly driven by the actual underlying adoption rates, on-chain transactions, total dollars of transactions, number of wallet addresses transacting, if you look at the price path over several cycles, it very much follows the growth in those underlying fundamentals. But what happens is because none of these technologies are mature enough to handle the demand, each cycle we go through this process of maxing out the capacity and then the flow of new people stops and then the casino stops and then the money stops and then we collapse, right? Our, our main assumption was that we would have several more cycles of 80 or 90% drawdowns between here and some eventual lowering of the growth rate once the law of large numbers really kicked in as the whole world basically had an on-chain wallet or was participating in crypto. It's very obvious that 3AC and other funds did not expect this to be a, you know, um, uh, a, a basic assumption of, of their investing. They th obviously thought that this was a very big left tail event. It wasn't, right? right. And so I'm a Almost little- Almost mathematically so, right? Like, of, yeah. it, given the volatility, you should expect this. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm a little disappointed in, you know, who were supposed to be very intelligent investors for not believing in this one very basic, very mathematically driven kind of baseline scenario. But I can, right, then I could go to the other side of like, well, that's how you raise all those billions of dollars. Of well, almost if you purposely put the blinders on and say, no, that those days are done. Give us your money. It's um, true. Yeah. The It also reminds me of people who are like, oh, well, we'll never have a great depression again. Right. Right. There'll never be that type of drawdown in, in the equity markets. I'm like, mm, yeah. Never say never. Um, it's kind of what I was trying to tell, you know, our investors uh, from the very beginning was that, look, the, the core assumption in our models is that this will likely happen again. And yet we don't run a long, short book. We run a long biased momentum and trend following driven book that does go to cash and can be, you know, it can be slightly net short at times. But even given the assumption of 80% drawdowns, I still don't believe that shorting is an incredibly good strategy in this market because the growth rate, the gains on just getting the upside right, 
so far outweigh, you know, tactically attempting to take 20 or 30% off the short side in a bear market that it's, it's just not worth it. And I was going to say like all these warts or narratives are blowing up. Like we didn't even talk about it as an inflation hedge seems like that's totally out the window. Oh Um, no. Yeah. So I'll give you my really short kind of, um, uh, f- uh, political philosophy of crypto, uh, which is probably very different from a lot of other kind of true believers, which is uh, uh, I don't believe in like the libertarian, like gold bug fantasy of this stuff. Like this stuff is all high beta tech. That's what yeah. it is, right? I tend to believe the Fed does a pretty good job most of the time, you know, <laughs> dealing with money supply. I'm not an inflation truther. I don't Even though you're there in your bunker in Montana. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think I don't think they're inflating away the you know value of your money or or anything like that. Um, uh, Bitcoin is definitely not an inflation hedge, never has been, never will be. None of this stuff, none of this stuff is. Uh, so yeah, it's you gotta treat it like a risk asset. It's the riskiest of risk assets. And then my question somewhere buried in there was going to say, like, even all these narratives were sort of debunking here. You don't care because you're systematic. So, right, like buy it up because of this reason. I don't care. Sells off because of that reason. I don't care. So is would it be fair to say you're trend following the coins? Yes. So we run basically a liquid portfolio no more than 20 positions at any given time. Uh, Our universe of coins today is, well, it's, it's, it's smaller today than it was four months ago. Let's say that, but uh, it's roughly 400 coins that have enough liquidity uh, for us to participate in. And uh, we mostly use uh, trend following and momentum models to govern the beta of the portfolio. Uh, And then we use cross-sectional momentum models to govern the asset selection within that beta. And, uh, and then we look at all of the on-chain fundamentals and all sorts of other uh, kind of uh, quantitative variables that have to do with attention and leverage and basically everything having to do with the casino. Like, how is it going in the casino? And, um, uh, and that works really well to keep you out of these you know, massive bear markets and then push the gas when it's really time to make money and uh, the market, you know, is telling you it's time to make money. So a lot of trend follower peeps listen here. So how do you do trend following when it's that volatile? Right. So you, a lot of people, I would <laughs> imagine you're going to get whipsawed like crazy if you use some of the standard techniques. So yeah. what are some of the, without giving away all the secret sauce, sure. how do you approach that with it being so volatile? No, we, we kind of pride ourselves on being very AQR-like in the fact that we're, we're glad to share our research. None of it is super rocket science. It's just all of the research that Cliff and I and many others have done in equities over the years applied to crypto, um, but used in a slightly different way. And, and you kind of you hit it, right? You need to adjust your models for the ball. Um, And I like to say to people, crypto is just like any other market, but more so in every way. (laughs) There's there's more vol, there's more returns, there's more fat finger shenanigans, there's more insider trading, there's more stupid actors. There's it's just it's markets, but more so. So um, in our strategy, because we are kind of a mid to long horizon uh, book. We have to um, expand the parameters for the timeframes for some of those trend following models. Uh, So one of the very basic naive models that we build on top of is a 550 exponential moving average crossover model. Um, Tends to work really well in crypto, but even with that, the expectation of max drawdown in the portfolio uh, is about 30%. So you have to be willing to take a significant hit to stay in the primary trend of these bull markets uh, if you really want these big six, seven, eight hundred percent, you know, kind of gain uh, moves, you know, during these cycles. Um, we also use more kind of don't chain channel, you know, type things. Um, the other kind of more interesting thing that we do is we 
I, used, uh, I always call him Donkian. Is it Donchian or Donkian? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Good question. Yeah. Tomato, tomato. Yeah. yeah. Um, we we have to um, kind of volume and volatility weight our moving averages as well, because mm. whereas in equities, you're dealing with kind of five days a week, mostly where there's not necessarily an equal amount of activity taking place. There's obviously more activity at the open and the close than in the middle of the day, but you're roughly getting the same amount of information each day, you know, as you are the next, but in crypto, because it's seven days a week and 24 hours a day, you really have to, um, you have to wait, uh, that, that moving average for the information, which does not take place, you know, equally in the market. And that's an important part of what we do. So that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that of like, yeah, what's, what's a day. Like yeah. Where do you, how does your model, when does it calculate? Just Yeah, everybody goes off of uh, UTC. So it's it's midnight UTC, which I don't know why we're still using that, but everybody still does. Got it. But you're not, and then did this require big tech investment too? So you're having to crunch all this data or you, it's relatively easy to get? No, look, AWS is pretty cheap at this point. Um, yeah. These aren't, you know, massive, massive, massive data sets. They're, you know, they're manageable. Um, but we... Excuse me. We do have a really good uh, team on the research side, and uh, definitely took a while. Mostly, the problem in crypto is that there really isn't great, uh, easily off the shelf, accessible pricing data and volume data because the market is so fragmented between on chain dexes and off chain CFI exchanges, and so it took us a long time to basically be able to combine all the things that we needed for all the different markets and all the different places for all the different coins uh, into a unified, uh, you know, pricing feed so that we could have a, you know, a, a reliable um, data set to both backtest and, and go forward on. And then, uh, so 20 coins in portfolio. So what you mentioned the liquidity, how liquid, what does that mean? How liquid do they have to be? And how do you measure that? Yeah, we, we need a certain amount of dollar traded volume a day that we can actually access on the exchanges that we can trade on. Um, and that's relative you know, to the size of our book. And uh, <clears throat> basically, we, we want to be able to get out of anything uh, within about six hours without moving the market too much. So you're never going to find us being, you know, uh, 15% of the book in a, you know, hundred million dollar token, just never going to happen. <laughs> um, but you, you may find us, you know, having a 15 or 20% position in a big L1 that's, you know, worth, uh, you know, $20 billion and trades, you know, a billion dollars a day in liquidity. What, what's an example of one of those? Uh, Solana or Got Ethereum it, yeah. or I mean, those, those are Ethereum's much bigger now, but, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so who's, who do you feel is on the other side of those trades when you're doing them? Is it retail? Is it DRW? Is it the prop shops? Uh, it's a good question. Um, depends on kind of what time frames you're, you're doing them on. Um, so in kind of classic trend following, you know, uh, strategy, we pyramid up into trades. So we're not taking full positions from day one. Um, you know, we, we believe in buy high and, and buy higher and buy more yeah. higher and sell higher. Um, uh, today, the liquidity coming from market makers is way better than it was two years ago. And Ken Griffin at Citadel is entering now. And so two years from now, the liquidity will be even better. And I will probably be trading against Ken um, or yeah, they'll probably be the counterparty to most trades that we yeah. make in two years. But today it's still, uh, I would say, um, a handful of kind of more crypto market makers like Wintermute and, and others. Uh, and then, yeah, during the bull phase, it is definitely very price incentive retail that is throwing market orders at this thing all day. Yeah. yeah like, please take one of those, take one of those. Um, you just triggered me of like, if you're trying to get out of what you said you don't do, but imagine some fund trying to get out of that 15% and a hundred million dollar coin, right. And the market makers on the other side, just hands in their pockets. 
Oh yeah. Uh, which I think is some of what we've seen recently, right? Of like That is exactly what's going on right now is uh, they've basically turned the computers off and the liquidity in the market has dropped by almost an order of magnitude for a, a lot of this long tail of stuff. Um, and, you know, one of my kind of favorite theses about markets, uh, and it goes back to, uh, you know, very classic research in equities is, um, if more analysts cover a small cap equity, there ends up being more liquidity and that raises the multiple and there's a feedback loop there, a positive feedback loop, right? Yep. So there's a classic kind of, you know, uh, well, alternative like a- data, stat arb strategy, right? Is, is kind of trend following off of analyst coverage lists and things like that. Um, in crypto, it's, it's the same thing, right? It's when liquidity goes up, prices go up, multiples go up. When liquidity goes down, this stuff is worthless. Hmm. And how do you measure that liquidity? That's the size of the order book or? Uh, mostly just oh, dollar volume traded per day, okay. honestly. Yeah, yeah okay. you, you could look at the order book, uh, but it, we, we keep it even more simple than that. And that's been going down over how long? The last three months, six months? Oh, yeah. Um, I'd say it really started to decline in late January. Uh, and it has significantly accelerated in the last month and a half or so. Which leads me to my, we're never getting back above 50,000 bet, right? Because like, how, what, how, what faith do you have that it's going to come back? Yeah. Right? So, so this is where, again, you know, hold two things in your mind at one time. Yeah. Um, I have 100%, you know, on dying faith that, the total market cap of crypto will come back above three, you know, trillion dollars for sure, no doubt about it. Will Bitcoin end up back above 50? I would say there's a very, very high probability because I think at least for one more cycle, the correlation between everything else in Bitcoin is still going to be pretty significant. At some point, that correlation will break. Bitcoin will fade into the background and this asset class will move on without it, likely. Hmm. But I think we probably still have one more cycle, which probably puts Bitcoin back above 50K. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm saying more from the liquidity standpoint, like have a bunch of softer players got blown out that were offering oh, yeah. liquidity. And now, so it'll take a while. Or that's your thesis. I guess. Like it'll take a while to build that yep. infrastructure back up and then you can get another leg higher. Yeah, look, bear markets end in one of two ways. It either ends in an apathy phase or it ends in a, you know, kind of su- superior capitulation, capitulatory event. That capitulatory event could then kind of coincide with some macroeconomic shift. The Fed could be done raising rates or something else could happen that, you know, is positive for risk assets. But yes, most of the time we do go through an apathy phase and, you um, and then it takes a while to build back up the type of institutional leverage that's needed to really set us off on another one of those runs. You do shorts, but very minimal amount of shorts. So talk about that for a minute, because right, yeah. a lot of classic trend followers would be rolling over in their graves if like, oh, we don't <laughs> take the short side, like yeah. curve fitting, yeah. that's no good, right? So there are times uh, when we use shorter term mean reversion models to hedge the book. Um, This will either happen kind of within a raging bull market where we just think things are super overcooked and we've made a ton of money and, you know, we want to hedge the book. Um, We'll hedge the book with uh, mostly just super liquid perpetual futures contracts on Ethereum, Bitcoin, you know, the biggest, you know, kind of stuff. And we try and match the beta of the portfolio um, with that stuff. There are other times like in December and early January where the market starts to roll over and our models are, you know, mid and long horizon momentum models start to roll over where we will hedge the book for longer periods of time. And we will believe, uh, and this did work pretty well in kind of late November to early January, that our asset selection will outperform our hedges. And uh, that was the case. Um, And then during parts of a bear market where we are mostly in cash, we will take very selective event-driven kind of short positions within that downtrend. And it's usually, um, it, it usually coincides with some structural arbitrage that we believe we're seeing 
And man, in this bear market, there have been so many of those. And we've been pretty conservative. We've made some money, but we've been pretty conservative with taking a lot of risk there. Terra was obviously one of them. Um, you know, uh, there, there's a bunch of others that have played out and they mostly have to do with just really poor tokenomic design. That the opportunity to, there would be to go short those? Yeah, to go short. Yeah. It, it basically produces massive inflationary effects within the uh, underlying number of tokens of the project. Yeah, and yeah. that produces a death spiral in, in the price. So, yeah. But how do you... What's it look like to even, do you have to borrow those to go short? What's that look like? No, we're mostly using perpetual futures contracts where we just have to pay the funding rate on, uh, on, on that. And, you know, sometimes those funding rates are five, 10% annually. And sometimes, you know, when everybody really is pretty sure that this thing's broken, it's 200%, right? right? And it's, we don't want to stick around for a year, right? We're sticking around for a week or two to mm -hmm. really get some kind of, you know, flush. And have you, te if it was just pure data driven, does it hold up the mo the trend models on both sides? It it does, uh, but it uh, it reduces um, it reduces the returns on the way up. So the uh, you're making you're making money more consistently, obviously, but the total return is actually lower. Um, the drawdown is also lower, but the total return is lower. And our point is to make as much money as we possibly can while stomaching the kind of all that we're willing to stomach. Mm. Um, and what we really don't want to do is be losing money while other people are making money. That, that's the worst thing. And your investors really hate that when that's the case. Right. And if my mind's like, well, I want some exposure to if, Ethereum goes to 50,000. I want that exposure, but I also want to step aside when, when things don't look so good. Exactly. Uh, and do you find most investors are like that? They want the, right? It, do you get some that are just, hey, I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you're trading Beanie Babies. Like <laughs> as long as you give me that absolute return, I'm happy. Or are they mostly like, no, I, I want exposure to crypto. That's why I'm here. Yeah. So we told our investors from day one that uh, this, this vehicle um, was a lot more of the latter than the former, that we may in the future run a vehicle that uh, is more, you know, market neutral, long, short, really high, sharp, but that this was the vehicle that they should want for, I believe in the beta of the asset class long-term, I am not willing to hodl, you know, through a 90% drawdown. Yeah. And it's very unlikely that they are going to pick assets correctly themselves. So we are the solution to that problem. And during the points in time when we step out of that beta exposure, we are farming stable coins basically. And so we're still producing kind of a, let's, let's call it a 15 or 20% return, uh, you know, annually on our capital during the points in time where we don't have any beta exposure in a, in a basically a market neutral way, but you're never going to find us swinging hard on the like long short side at like holding a lot of beta exposure on, on either side. So help me keep those two thoughts in my head. You're, we were poo pooing farming before or no, just the illegitimate farming. No, I, look, so I, I think- Help me understand those two yeah. things of like, now I'm, before these guys were doing weird stuff when they were trying to get yeah. yield, now this is okay, yield over here. This is a perfect example. Yeah. In November and December, we were in the terror trade. We not only owned Luna, but we were also collecting that 22% yield in, in Terra, right? There are times when you want to own the Ponzi schemes, right? Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it's a Ponzi or if it's what we call kind of a uh, <laughs> subsidized yield, you know, company or scheme. Yeah. Right? Um, but when all of the other variables roll over that make those things risky to own, you want to get the hell out of the way of them. Right. And which we did. Uh, so what we do is even when we own a lot of beta assets, we take those beta assets and we liquidity mine and farm all of them at all times. So we are pairing them up inside of DEXs. 
we are lending them out on lending protocols and then, or we're using them as collateral on lending protocols to then take out stable coins and farm the stable coins for extra yield. So we're always producing extra yield on top of the book, but this is most important when, you know, we have no beta exposure and we're still producing returns, you know, like this in a bear market. Now, the way that I explain kind of yield farming and, and, uh, and liquidity mining to people is, yes, a lot of these protocols are unsustainable, right? They're basically giving you equity in their project for simply providing liquidity. And most of the tokenomics for most of these projects are not sustainable. I don't want to own their governance token, right? I want to liquidate that every single day. I want to, you know, I want to, I want to grab it and liquidate it every single day for the yield, right? And move on. Um, and a lot of those things will collapse over time. I don't really care. I made money from it, right? Yeah. Um, but you definitely don't want to own the beta of some of those uh, projects. It makes me think I was, we're in the golden age of sports betting apps, right? And so you like sign up, get a free $500. That's it. Right? Yeah. Like, hey, there's 30 of those. I just got 50. Dude, grand. if you're willing to yeah. pay me to nominally participate at no risk, except for hacking yeah. risk, because there's, there's on-chain hacking, or that's really the risk. If you're willing to pay me to participate in your thing and I don't really have to do much, I'm going to take that money all day. Yeah. But help me understand that because I'm still thinking there's the risk that it turns into Luna and goes to zero. Yes. So, yeah. so the, the risk is, yeah, just explain how you view that risk. Yeah. So the, the main risk is hacking risk. And then the second risk is protocol design. Um, so what we do is we score every protocol that we provide liquidity to or that we farm on eight different variables um, on a one to 10 basis. And then we basically add up that risk score. And then we look at the yield that we should be getting and we look at a risk adjusted yield. Hmm. And then we position size into those protocols on a risk adjusted basis. Um, and one of the main things that we have to look at is what percentage of the liquidity pool are you? You never want to be bigger than 10% because you don't want to be the liquidity of last resort in a run book, right? Yeah. We have to monitor for the withdrawal of other people's liquidity so that we're not in the run book. <laughs> um, and then you have to really understand the tokenomics and the dynamics of the system, right? So if Terra is subsidizing the yield that they're giving out, in an unsustainable way, you just have to know when it becomes unsustainable and when it's still sustainable. And there are, you know, variables that we looked at, which have to do with the size of the um, the size of the reserve that they had and the number of people that were borrowing, so paying into the system. And when those things break, you you just got to be ready to get the hell out of there. Uh, and would you equate it to just like? a long short fund that's loaning out their long book, right? To get a little um, extra yield. I'd say it's a little bit more sophisticated than that because we're a little bit further out on the curve there in looking for protocols that are new, that we've read the code, we've read the audits of the code. Maybe we know the founders. Maybe we know that it's a fork of another protocol that we know on another chain that we think is really safe. And we are looking to capture the rewards tokens from maybe an initial three or four month launch where they're really trying to gather users. And um, uh, so there's a little bit more work that goes into it than just shoving money into Aave and uh, getting, yeah, yeah. you know, seven or 8%. Yeah. And how do you think about like the longevity of that whole ecosystem? Right. Like, so for early days and grab the money in these first few years or whatnot, like how will you know when the, I mean, I guess you'll stop seeing new tokens with rewards, right? Right. So I guess we have two really big, like philosophical theses about DeFi, I guess you, you would say, right? One of them is the casino is the boot program for the real utility in the end, right? You need the casino in order to get the liquidity and the people into the system so that you can actually build real utility eventually for everybody to use in real world stuff, right? Which is the complaint right now that Web3 doesn't actually do anything except for enable the casino. The other big thesis is that the ability to bootstrap a decentralized system 
with these rewards is not a bit thing in this whole system. It is the thing, right? Like it is a really important piece of why this whole thing works long term. In a sense, you're going from Uber having to raise enormous amounts of VC money, right? To then throw it advertising to get people onto their system and fight a land grab war to instead of raising money from the VCs, you're giving the money to your users, right? And just like venture back tech companies, many will fail, most will fail, but some will attain escape velocity to the point where the system becomes liquid enough that they no longer have to give out the rewards and there's real utility in their protocol. This is something like Uniswap, right? Which has become big enough that they no longer really have to give out those rewards. So I think that this is not only going to be around, but this is going to be a bigger piece of how companies actually bootstrap themselves in the future. And so I think as we go forward, you're going to see more and more protocols doing this and more and more money to be grabbed. At the same time, we're going to have more competition at the far end of the spectrum for grabbing those really good rewards from other intelligent institutional investors. And so if I think of it like that, of like, okay, I'm investing in all these private companies and they're paying me to give them money, which seems weird, but yeah, but yeah. I guess it's right. It's like, Hey, I'm giving you to I'm rent, not just, maybe, maybe the right way to rent them money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not just giving you money. I'm I, you're selling me a bond, right? I'm giving you money yeah. and you're giving me a yield. Um, but the kicker here is you can pull it at any time. Yep. Um, which leads me to like, won't they eventually start coming up with like, Hey, you get a better yield if you keep it in there longer. Or like, I don't, I don't want the money to be pulled right away. So what does that look like? That has already happened. So we call it the the VE model, which actually makes no sense. Vote escrow, which comes from a different thing, but it's, it's still the same concept where you're giving different amounts of yield to people who have had the money in the liquidity pool for different amounts of time. Um, And and it kind of brings me to the concept of, I I think we're really, really, really early in the development of all these tokenomic systems. And we've been through a couple different cycles now, you know, DeFi 1.0, DeFi 2.0, DeFi run three now, right? Like, and it just shows how early we are in the whole thing that we're still in the very early experimentation stage of figuring out what incents the right behavior on all sides of the system yeah. to build these networks into what they should eventually be. I feel like that goes against the libertarian ethos, right? Of like, <laughs> no one gets a special deal, right? <laughs> Everyone gets well, the, yeah. the, That's the thing about crypto is they say it's this like libertarian thing, but at the end of the day, it is, it is, it, it's, it's weighted and it's like there are philosophical views on all sides. It's, it's nothing. Yeah. It's not one thing. It's, it's everything. How do you feel about like all the retail that got killed in Solana and, um, and all these coins, but right. Or you feel like, is this any different than any other thing of like, Hey, I was selling GameStop into them buying it up and it's just how I do my business and they know the risks. And yeah, I mean, uh, I think in every single asset bubble retail is going to behave poorly because to be really honest, I, I don't believe that individuals should be playing around in pools like this. They get screwed every single time. And uh, they shouldn't do it. Yet our society believes that they should have the ability to do it. Personally, I believe that they should have the ability to do it. I don't think they should, but they should have the right to do it. And um, it's kind of inevitable. It's it's just like any other asset class where, uh, you know, look, you wouldn't walk into an operating room and do brain surgery, right, without being a brain surgeon, nor should you be playing in a hundred vol asset, right, mm-hmm. without being a without being somebody who understands how to manage risk. Um, yeah. But that's the story of markets since the beginning of time. The, right, it's almost the same thing of like, you put money into your buddy's restaurant you did all this, like people just jump into risky things all the time. The, do you think when the, so are you big on like institutions will come and it'll save the day and all this stuff? And if so, once the institutional money, I'm, think institutional money is usually just as dumb as retail they just have more money um, <laughs> well we just saw that yeah <laughs> yeah so right basically well those 
even if the retail slows down and will the institutional just be a never ending stream of, there's a question in here somewhere. Do you think the institutional money will come and just get the beta or will they do beta plus kind of like the stuff you're doing? Um, the institutions are definitely going to do beta plus eventually. I think we're probably on the leading edge of that. Uh, the, the pure beta has been a pretty naive set, you know, up until now there's, there's some coming like us. Um, look, I, I think retail will be involved in every additional cycle, right? And, and this whole thing requires retail. It cannot be driven by institutions because it requires the actual users in the protocols, right? Mm. Um, so, for example, there is a, uh, a company and a protocol that's going to be launching. I'm, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but it's basically you buy a $500 dash cam for your car, you stick it to the car and you drive around and it maps the road and then it sends it up into the cloud, right? And you get paid in their cryptocurrency based on all the different variables of your mapping, right? Um, that requires consumers, you know, to yeah. retail to be a part of it, right? And so this market cannot go forward without retail. And institutions will not be the driving factor in it. And as you said, institutions are just as dumb as retail, but in different ways, right? Yeah. They tend to take too much leverage at the wrong times. And, you know, they tend, it, 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 they're, just, they're just as dumb, but in very different ways. No offense to all our institutional investors that are listening. The, um, and what, are you starting to see more interest from institutions? And what does that look like in terms of like, percent you think they might get to versus what percent yeah. they are now? Yeah. You know, in speaking with a lot of pension funds, um, they are going to have, and some already do, um, the mandate to invest, you know, one or 2% of their, you know, assets into crypto. Right now, what we're seeing is with most large institutions, they are comfortable with, as Cliff would say, the volatility laundered, you know, kind of way to do it, where they give VCs money for 10 years, they shut their eyes, they pretend they don't know what's going on, and the VCs come back with returns or not in 10 years, and they say, okay, great. Um, and I understand why that's the case, right? They're starting to come around to liquid um, kind of strategies like ours, where they can see why it worked in other asset classes and they understand why it should be ported over to this asset class and why the risk reward is even maybe even better in this asset class uh, for those strategies. But it's early for that, for sure. Most of the institutional money that's being allocated to vehicles like ours are more fund of funds in crypto and family offices. Um, versus like really, really large pension funds. And what about the name? Where, where'd it come from? Star Killer. So I, I don't know if you uh, remember, it, it was going around pretty good about it. seven or eight years ago, there was a paper that was written that looked at how um, institutional managers named their, their funds and, uh, what it, and, and the connection between those names and how much capital they raised and their returns relative to their peers. And the basic finding of the paper, uh, which I think is published in the journal of finance or, or, or one of those, was that- um, Use a Greek name or something. Well, no, it was funds, <laughs> it was funds with warlike names um, tended to outperform on both of those variables. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a Star Wars nerd. And uh, I was you know, just kind of thinking about that when we were naming uh, the firm and um, yeah, so Star Killer kind of made sense. Star Killer base, I, I, right? Yeah, I kind of I like Battlestar, but that was already taken by uh, another fund. Um, there so you go. Yeah. Star Wars fan investing guide to investments, and I have on here Bitcoin equals Jar Jar Binks. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> I did it. I can't remember when we did that. It was two twenty somewhere, twenty twelve or thirteen. Um, with the tagline, you really th expect us to take this seriously? <laughs> um, I'll send you. I'll send you a copy to that. Talking about those family offices, talking about those fund funds. How do how do they go about doing the due diligence? Right when you're talking about, oh, we could yield from here. The only real risk is the exchange going bust or hack. 
like that's the ultimate risk. So how do they view that? How do you do the due diligence when it's not even really what you're doing is the real risk? It's the risk of what you're investing in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say um, most of those institutional investors, honestly, they don't fully understand the concept of yield farming and the risks. To be honest, they, um, they get it conceptually, right? But if they had to go and do it, they wouldn't know the first thing about how to. Hmm. So I think they're asking all the right questions, which is what are the variables that you look at? How do you manage risk? How do you manage drawdowns? How do you manage custody risk and hacking risk and, and all of those other things? So they're, they're asking all the right questions. But um, at the end of the day, I do get the feeling that a lot of the time they don't really actually understand where the yield come from uh, comes from. It's it's kind of like a thing that's sitting there in the ether, and we can go grab it. So great, go grab it uh, if you can grab it without blowing up. Um, yeah, use use my gambling app uh, analogy now, right? It's like these are just all gambling apps that give you rewards for participating. Um, but to me, I even have a hard time of thinking of that with our compatriot, Jason Buck of like, well, hold on. Like, how do I assess the risk that this thing's great? We want to put money into it, but there's a non-zero chance that they're at some exchange that goes bust. Right. So you just do that with position sizing, but then that gets weird. Into, um, into the protocols, it's about risk, you know, risk adjusted position sizing in terms of holding coins on centralized exchanges. Uh, we, we hold assets on a very, very limited number of places. In fact, right now it's two and you likely won't see it be more than three or four at any given time. Cause that's really all the C5 that we trust. And as you're seeing right now, and I, I think, um, Sam from, uh, FTX, uh, made a comment today that there are a whole bunch more tier two and three brokerages that are insolvent that we don't know about yet, but he does. And he said, they're, you'll see them, they're insolvent. So there's a reason why we have not held any assets on any of those other places, because the history of crypto is they mostly blow up. So, yeah. you know, Coinbase is public. If they blow up, they're gonna sell stock to raise cash and they're gonna make people whole. Great, okay, fine. FTX does things But really meanwhile, well. their stock's down 90%. So it's like, are they blowing up? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the scary part. So. So Coinbase and FTX are your two? Coinbase and FTX. And I do trust Binance for execution, but I would not actually hold my coins there. I would take them straight off and we, we put them on, on chain. Yeah. I think I'm going to name this pod, the ability to hold separate thoughts in your head. Because right, it's like crazy to be like, oh, I wouldn't trust any of these exchanges, but these two look okay. Here's, here's the best <laughs> one. Here's the best one. Here's the best like hold two thoughts in your head at one time. So Tether, right? A lot of people think Tether is insolvent. I don't know. Maybe it is, right? Honestly, I couldn't care less, but there's a trade there, right? And the trade is, if you have an account at Tether and Tether is trading at 90 cents on the dollar because people get worried that maybe it's insolvent, I can go take dollars, lever them up in DeFi, trade those USDC coins for Tether at 90 cents and then go right back to Tether and redeem them for a dollar into my bank account and make 10% right away plus the leverage with almost no risk. And so I don't care if Tether is insolvent or not, whatever, there's an ARB there that we will do if that happens again. Why doesn't it, that get arbed away? You're saying it does. It appears for a second and then it gets arbed away. It, it appears because people panic. They say, oh, it's, you know, it's insolvent. Tether doesn't stop withdrawals because even if it was insolvent, it's not like 80% insolvent. Maybe it's like 5% insolvent, right? Okay, well, that means that they're not going to stop withdrawals until you've literally redeemed 95% of their capital and then mm -hmm. they're going to shut it off. But if you're at the beginning of that process and we can see how much they're redeeming, well, all right, I'll take that 10%. I'll take it all day. Right, I guess that's the key here too, right? Everything's on chain so you can monitor. This isn't like a fund with, monthly liquidity where I don't know who's all put in their redemptions and how it's affecting position sizing and whatnot. Yep. Um, we can see the market cap of Tether tokens in real time. I I would say it's like we're at the uh, Bellagio and we're going to the pool and there's like 10 turds over in the corner <laughs> floating around in the pool and they're like, no, but this corner over here is a good, right? This side yeah. of the pool is really nice. And, and Cuffy, I'm like, yeah, but over there, like, don't worry about it. 
So that that's my mental hiccup of like, if there's some contamination there, do you even want to be in the whole or just pool? or just go into the pool with a hazmat suit, which is what we do. Right? <laughs> there you go. But then that's not as fun. But it's not as uh, fun. You're right. It's it's not as fun, and you got to work a lot harder to meet the girl. And you know, like it's it's just you got to go into the hazmat suit though. I'm going to finish with, we asked your hottest take. You were given some hot take before, but I didn't prep you for this, but what's, what's your hottest take either crypto based or New York Rangers based or oh. where, wherever <laughs> you want to go. Sorry for your loss, by the way. What? They yeah. Made it. They ran out of gas. Um, but so did, uh, but so did Tampa against, uh, against the abs who were the yeah. best. They deserve to win it. Um, Oh, my hottest take. Uh, um, yeah, I'll go. I'll go with. Uh, there is another 10x cycle in crypto, like for sure. There's there's another 10x cycle. So personally, you're backing up the truck and and loading it up, or you want to do it in a the same in a smart way of well, all of against all of my personal money is in the you know in the asset management firm, the vehicle that we run. Uh, yeah. That's that's my that's a lot of my stuff. So, <laughs> um, so when our models say to go back in, that I will be really heavily exposed, and mm-hmm. and that'll likely be sometime in the next you know uh, either six months, right? Is is likely? I'd say. The how do you feel about that? Because I read that. I admire it, but I also think it's it's incredibly risky to be like you're double exposed, right? So you have your it is. your livelihood based on this model, and then your personal wealth so look, based on the model too. There, there are two things here, and one of the things that we told you know our investors is, and that we've done legally, is um, we are not taking any carry out of the vehicle uh, for the next three years. Hmm. Now we we take the, um, you know the the mark, yeah. But we can't withdraw it, right? Yeah, so yeah. we're right there along with all of our uh, investors. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, look, if you're going to run a strategic beta oriented, you know, long bias strategy with a lot of all, uh, I think your investors should want you to really be skin in the game there with them. Um, so, uh, what, am I a hundred percent comfortable with having this amount of personal capital in this vehicle? No, not, not really, <laughs> not a hundred percent comfortable with that. Um, do I think it's going to work out long-term very, very well? Yes. Is it a necessary thing to show that kind of confidence to our investors also? Yes, I think so. Was, were the three AC guys invested in there? I don't know. It, I don't know the answer to that. Probably it, so- probably some nominal amount, but it seems like they. I think, I think if you think about three AC or some of the other funds have done supposedly really, really well over time, I think their GPs have taken a lot of uh, money off the table. Definitely. The, uh, my buddy down the road from you and Bozeman was early into crypto and got some out and bought a ranch, Nice. uh, small, small property, but still converting. Um, Last question. This is from our old season one. We used to ask every guest favorite Star Wars character. So I'll, I'll bring it back since you're a fan. Ooh, a favorite one. favorite Star Wars character. Um, I'm still going. I'm still going Yoda. Uh, I think. I think the whole ethos of Star Wars is wrapped up in in him, basically. For sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are other characters that are you know, that have more going on, but, but he, I think represents the story from beginning to end, like his, his philosophical kind of take on it. I love it. And in the prequels, we saw him kick some ass. So that's good. Um, Awesome. This has been fun, Lee. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you hopefully next time I'm up your way. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. What what are we going to do? You're going to take me skiing, hiking, all the above. Oh dude, we were wakeboarding the other day. Um, you know, there are some pretty challenging hikes up in the park, like uh, Saya Pass or that are, you know, they'll, they'll exhaust you. And then at the end of the day in the park, you jump into one of the glacial rivers there, which is super cold, but it's, yeah, it's a lot of fun.
Yeah, what did my son and I did in Anaconda? Is that the name of the town? It's like south, um, did a 13,000 peak there. Yep. Which was fun. Uh, awesome. We'll talk to you soon. Best of luck with everything. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care. That's it for the pod. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Lee, for coming on. Thanks to our producer, Jeff Berger. Thanks to RCM for the support. If you had a good time, please go like the show and give it a rating on Apple or Spotify. It really helps us in convincing great guests like this to come on. Thanks again. See you next week. You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCM Alts and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalts.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors.